So first I want to recap the meta learning problem and black box meta learning just to provide a little bit of review and refresher. Then today we'll talk primarily about optimization based meta, -learner, meta learning and we'll cover the overall approach. We'll compare optimization based and black box meta learning. Uh, conceptually, we'll talk about some of the challenges with optimization based meta learning and some solutions. I also noticed that there's a typo here that I'll uh, fix with the, with the pen, so it should be optimization based meta learning. And then we'll also talk about a case study that applies meta learning to the problem of land cover classification. And the goals for the end of the lecture are hopefully you'll be able to understand the basics of optimization based meta learning, as well as generally how to go about implementing them, and also understand the trade offs between black box and optimization based meta learning approaches. Great. Um, so let's get started. To recap what we talked a bit about last time, um, we talked about transfer learning and also the meta learning problem. And we talked about how these different problem settings relate also with multitask learning. So in multitask learning, the goal is to solve multiple tasks all at once. In meta learning, the goal is to, given data from multiple tasks, be able to leverage that to quickly solve a new task with a small amount of data. And in transfer learning, the goal is to solve a new task after solving some previous source task by transferring knowledge. Um, although kind of the lines between transfer learning and, and meta learning may be blurred a little bit uh, and can be, uh, meta learning can be viewed as an instantiation of transfer learning. Um, if you sort of view the source task as the set of n meta training tasks. Um, in both transfer learning and meta learning is generally impractical to access the previous tasks. And in all of these settings, the tasks must share some amount of structure in order to actually see a benefit from these methods in comparison to independently training on each of the tasks. We also talked about kind of what an example meta learning problem might look like. So, for example, if you look at um, few shot image classification from the mini image data set, mini image net data set, uh, at test time, your goal is to classify new examples after seeing a tiny training data set of only five examples. And the way that you go about trying to solve this few shot learning problem is to structure image data from other image classes into different mini train sets and test sets uh, and learn how to learn each, each of these tasks so that you're well prepared to solve the meta test task at the top with held out image classes. Uh, and of course, this is an example in the image classification domain, but you can replace each of these tasks with regression problems, language generation problems, skill learning problems, really a, a wide range of machine learning problems. Um, and then after we talked about the meta learning problem statement, we also talked about black box adaptation. And this is a class of meta learning algorithms that basically take your training data set for each of these tasks, pass this through a neural network, that produces the weights of another neural network by I. And then you take new examples that you want to be able to classify and pass that through your network with by I to get the corresponding prediction. And this whole process is kind of trained end to end with respect to your performance on these held out, the, these test examples for each of your tasks. Um, and this could kind of be viewed as a general form of, of, of neural network that takes as input a training data set and a new input and is trained to be able to make a correct prediction for that new input. Okay, and then one of the main benefits of this approach is it's very expressive and one of the main downsides is that it's a pretty challenging optimization problem because you need to actually learn to process data and learn from data completely from scratch from a randomly initialized neural network F theta. Okay, so that's a brief, brief recap of what we covered last time. Now, one question that may come up is, well, so right now this, we have this black box neural network that's representing, um, that's representing this kind of learning process, right? That's taking in a training data set and outputting the weights of another neural network. Uh, and there might be other ways that we can represent this process. And instead of treating it as this kind of black box inference procedure, we could instead treat it as an optimization procedure. Uh, and in many ways, this is kind of the main idea behind optimization-based meta-learning. 
So if you take the black box uh, adaptation approach, if you want to make it optimization based, what you can simply do is replace the neural network that produces phi i with something that looks more like an optimization process, and then meta-learn all the free parameters of that optimization process, such as the initialization, the learning rate, or other, um, other ways that you might kind of tweak this, this optimization. So kind of the key idea is to embed an optimization inside this inner learning process. Now, why might this make sense in comparison to a black box adaptation approach? Well, so one way to look at this is actually from the perspective of fine tuning and transfer learning. So one thing that we saw before with, with fine tuning was that if you uh, start with a set of pre-trained parameters and fine tune, this is quite effective, especially when you have uh, a fairly kind of uh, sizable number of training examples that you're fine tuning on. But this is less effective with very small data sets. And so essentially what the question that optimization-based meta-learning algorithms try to seek to answer is, well, what if instead of uh, initializing from a set of pre-trained parameters initialized on the ImageNet, for example, what if we explicitly optimized for a set of pre-trained parameters and maybe also the learning rate or other aspects of this fine-tuning process so that we can generalize effectively with a small number of examples? Um, and so in particular, one instantiation of this, which is the, called the model agnostic meta-learning algorithm, it tries to be able to do fine-tuning at test time and it tries to find a set of pre-trained parameters such that fine-tuning generalizes well with a small amount of data. And the way that this optimization looks like is we take the fine-tuning process. Uh, we say, okay, we, we want this fine-tuning process to generalize well with a small training data set. So we'll feed in a small training data set and then evaluate fine-tuning on new held out data points in our task test set. And then we'll optimize for the initialization for theta such that this one or a few steps of fine tuning generalizes well to these new data points. And then of course we do this optimization across all of the tasks in our meta training set. So the key idea here is we're essentially going to be trying to learn a parameter vector theta that can transfer to all of the tasks in our meta training data set with a few steps of fine tuning. Um, this equation shows one gradient step. Uh, in practice, it could, could just be one, or it could be a few or a handful. Um, although as you kind of increase the number of gradient steps, it gets a little bit, this, this kind of optimization problem gets a little bit more unwieldy. Okay, so this is kind of the, uh, kind of a, a basic version of an optimization-based, kind of the gist of an optimization-based meta-learner in the sense that it's kind of embedding this optimization inside the process in order to get, um, this will give you something that looks like phi i. Basically fine tuning will get you phi i and then you're optimizing for a phi i such that it generalizes on the test set. Um, and then one way that you could view this process more visually is say theta is the parameter vector that you're meta-learning and phi i star is the optimal parameter vector for all of your meta-training tasks, then in some sense you could view the meta-learning process as this thick black line here, where when you're at this point during the meta-training process, if you take a gradient step with respect to task three, you're quite far from the optimum for task three. Um, and likewise, kind of for the other tasks, if you take a single gradient step for task two, you're quite far from the optimum, and likewise for task one. Whereas by the time you get to the end of the meta-training process, if you take a gradient step with respect to task three, you're, you're much closer and likewise for all of the other tasks. So this is kind of a, a cartoon diagram to give some intuition for what this sort of meta-training algorithm might be doing. Okay, so there's a question from in the chat. Uh, won't we need to calculate the double derivatives of the loss for the optimization? Does this slow down the algorithm? Uh, yes, we will have to compute the second derivatives, and we'll get to this in, on the next slide, basically. Yeah, and then is asking, why do we only do one step of gradient descent rather than multiple steps? 
So uh, you, can def you can absolutely implement this with multiple steps. Uh, and it's actually pretty common to implement it with multiple gradient steps. I'm writing it only as a single step here for now because that's simpler notationally. It takes a little bit more screen space to write down multiple steps. Um, if you want to do a very large number of gradient steps, then it also, as I mentioned before, it gets very computationally expensive. And so typically you will do around like five gradient steps um, or fewer than that, maybe 10. Um, there are some works that go beyond that as well, but in practice you can get the, you can get actually pretty far with only a few gradient steps. Do you have a question? Um, yeah. So are you basically, the way you're training this, are you sort of trying to get a set of parameters to your data that you initialize uh, directly with those parameters given a uh, uh, test task? And you want to, you and, the way, and then what you want to do is you want those parameters to be so good that when you initialize with them, you can do like, I guess, few shot, few shot optimization and then get a good performance of the test task. Is that the idea of data? Yeah, exactly. So the goal of theta is to basically find a set of pre-trained parameters that are so good that even with a few steps of gradient descent on a small data set, you can generalize well from those examples. I was asking, do you compute the gradient on a batch or sample mini batches? So let's actually go to the next slide to, to answer this. So this is what's called a model agnostic meta learning algorithm, or MAML for short, um, in the sense that it's agnostic, like the, the model architecture doesn't really play a role anywhere in here. And so, really, any architecture should be able to work for this, um, or any loss function, as long as the architecture and the loss function are amenable to this form of gradient based optimization. So in terms of what this looks like as an algorithm, so I talked just about the objective on the previous slides, how do we actually optimize this objective in an algorithm? So we can take the same algorithm from the black box approach, and there's just a few things that will change. So first we'll sample a mini batch of tasks, we'll sample disjoint data sets, detrain and detest, and then instead of computing uh, the parameters from just with this neural network, we're instead going to compute these parameters by fine tuning from our current meta parameters. And then when we update the model, um, we're going to use basically the same update as before, where uh, we're going to back propagate through this fine tuning process to the initialization um, in order to update our meta parameters. As was mentioned by, uh, by Div, this actually does bring up second order derivatives. Um, and I guess I'll talk about that in a second. First, I want to ask, answer a um, question. What's your question? Um, yeah, so I think I'm, I'm still struggling to understand the intuition uh, because what we are doing here is that we're taking the, uh, the D train for a task. Um, and even though we take just small gradient steps, uh, we are updating the, uh, the entire theta, which means like all the parameters. So, so why does it work um, like, always um, or in all cases, is, is, isn't there a potential for like uh, some large perturbations uh, because of some task? Yeah, so I guess a, a few thoughts here. One is that the this alpha parameter, um, you could either have it be a hyper, this is kind of the learning rate of the fine tuning process, you could either have it be a hyper parameter or have it be learned. Um, although it, in many cases it's just a hyper parameter and you can actually set this to be pretty large so that it's actually taking pretty large gradient steps on your few shot data set. Now, one thing you might be worried about is you might overfit to this really small data set, especially if you're taking very large steps. Um, however, with this optimization, you're kind of explicitly optimizing for a point in the parameter space that won't lead to overfitting when you take a few gradient steps on a small data set. Um, so kind of by nature of actually optimizing explicitly for the kind of region of parameter space that you're in and for this, these initial features, you can um, avoid these problems in principle. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that that makes sense uh, to, to an extent, but I'm just wondering that uh, would this not, um, like the prior task uh, would would we not lose accuracy on them um, as we start to do this on future tasks? 
Um, right, so when we do this on new tasks at test time, we need to assume that those tasks are still somewhat similar to the tasks that we saw during meta training. Um, and specifically, we, they need to be from the same distribution as the tasks that we saw during meta training. Uh, and if we have enough tasks and, and the tasks that we see at test time are in that same distribution, then we can expect it to work well for those tasks. If you get a, give it a completely unrelated task that isn't from that distribution, then um, you may not expect it to generalize as well. Okay, thanks. Great, and then I also saw that there was a question in the chat about what is phi i again. Um, so in this case, I'm using phi i to denote the, just the kind of the, uh, the fine-tuned parameters as a result of fine-tuning from theta on the few shot data set di train. Um, on the previous slide, I also mentioned, I also had uh, a notation for phi i star, and this was the optimal parameter vectors for, for that task. Um, just because uh, as an illustrative diagram. Okay, do you have a question? Yes, so uh, I'm also having a bit of trouble understanding phi i. So phi i within step three is a copy of theta and then we try to optimize that using test and then, then we optimize the actual theta. So phi i is the result of running gradient descent on theta. So after you run, um, after you basically, so theta is your kind of meta parameters. It's the initial parameters that you're, uh, that you're learning throughout the meta training process. And then phi i is, a, um, is the result of taking multiple gradient steps on theta, starting from theta, on your training data set for that task. But we are updating theta in step four, right? So in step three, we are optimizing a copy of theta, right? Is that how to interpret it? Yeah, so yeah. So in step three, you're optimizing a copy of theta. And a question that was also asked in the chat is, do we, do we reinitialize theta for each i? And that's correct. So we're always going to be starting fine tuning from this set of initial parameters theta. We're not going to be starting it from where we had fine tuned to last. OK. Great. Yeah, so the training data here refers to like samples from multiple tasks and not a single task. Right. So D train I corresponds to the training data for a single task. So you sample a task here, um, then you sample, then you kind of split the data for that task into a train set and a test set. Um, these are both from the same task. Then you run fine tuning on data from that task and uh, measure how well the fine-tuned parameters generalize to new data from that task, and then you update your meta-parameters. So how does that may also a mini batch of tasks as well. Right, uh, I'm just trying to understand how is this different from, uh, let's say, transfer learning, where you would train, you would take an, a model trained on ImageNet and fine-tune it for some other task. Yeah, so the way that this is different from like um, from transfer learning and fine tuning is that in transfer learning and fine tuning, you optimize your data, your initial parameters by training on training kind of directly on a previous task or a previous set of tasks, basically trying to um, let's see. Uh, I'm So what transfer learning would try to do is it would say kind of um, theta init equals basically min of theta of L of theta um, di, and maybe you're do maybe you're kind of uh, this is what transfer learning is doing. I'll call it TL. Basically, it's going to try to find initial parameters such that you minimize your loss on your set of training tasks. And then at test time, you fine tune this data init on other things. And then what this is doing, which is a bit different, is it's learning a set of initial parameters such that um, optimize over tasks. Uh, basically, you just replace uh, theta with phi i, and this is on the test set for task i, 
where phi i equals the fine-tuned version of um, of this. So the key difference is that in transfer learning, you would basically be optimizing just so that theta does well on all of your tasks. And what this is doing is it's optimizing such that when you fine tune from theta, you do well on your tasks. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Great. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, this, this might be something you're going to um, address later in the lecture, but I was wondering if there are any theoretical guarantees of, um, I mean, I guess like the optimization or uh, this approach in general. Yeah, so we'll talk a bit about theoretically what the expressive power of this meta learner is. Um, there is also some work on that studies basically the theoretical guarantees of whether this meta learning process will actually give you the optimum. Um, and I won't actually cover that in the lecture, but if you're interested in that, maybe make a post on Piazza and I can send some pointer references. Okay, thank you. So my question is like in step three, we are learning this uh, task specific parameter by taking one variant step from this global theta, which is common among, common, common among all tasks. So when we do in step four, the gradient loss again with uh, the error in the specific task phi i, how many gradient step we take in step four? Because step three we are taking one gradient step, right? So so when we do the next step, so yeah, so when we update it using um, in this fourth step when we're updating the meta parameters. Uh, typically, you would just run one gradient step on theta. Uh, and in order to compute this gradient right here, you need to kind of a prerequisite is you need to compute phi i. Um, so you basically alternate between computing phi i and then computing the gradient of your meta parameters. Basically, in both step and three, we take one gradient step. Uh, one is for this uh, theta to the task of problem, and again for the uh, loss on the step four. Yes. Um, Although here you could also run, it's pretty common to also run more than one gradient step for this one. Um, it's, it's, this can be a few gradient steps. Here you really um, want this to be just a single gradient step because it's only pertinent to this, uh, this value of phi i. Thank you. Um, I just want to check that I understood the difference between these three algorithms correctly. So in black box approach, you directly initialize uh, your model with uh, your learn set data without doing any um, uh, data descent and you use that to compute the loss on the task data set. Um, and to update the um, model, to update data. And in the optimization based approach, um, you add additional freedom between steps to the so that's close. So the black box model um, that's shown right here, this is kind of having a neural network basically represent the optimization itself. It's outputting phi i directly, whereas in the optimization based approach, the meta parameters correspond to the initialization. And to get phi i, the task specific parameters, you are running an optimization. Oh, so the yeah. Yeah. There's kind of no, no optimization um, that happens. You just run, you just take your neural network and run it forward. Whereas in the optimization based meta learner, you're running this optimization. Okay, can you figure out the black box approach? And that would output the parameter of your actual network. Yeah. And in the optimization based approach, it outputs the gradients you want to take in the actual network. Um, basically, yes. Although in the optimization based approach, basically you're in, in this case you're just op you're optimizing the initial parameters, and then the way that you get the gradients are by act taking the actual gradient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, great. Great. Cool. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a question, like, how is it different from the black box approach? In step three, like, we are setting phi i as a function of theta and 
DK9, but there are also like PIA is a function of theta and DK9 in some way. Yeah, so they're both um, they're both kind of a function of theta and the training data. Uh, one is that one of them is using a neural network to produce phi i, and one of them is using an optimization to produce phi i. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I was wondering, so you mentioned the second order derivatives. I was trying to think through if you have multiple gradient steps on step three. Um, would that like keep nesting and get like higher and higher order derivatives, or I might be picturing something wrong there? Yeah, that's a great question. And I was actually planning to talk about that next. So that's, let's actually talk about that. So there's two questions that come up here. One is, we have second order derivatives. Does that mean that we need to compute the full Hessian? Uh, and if we did, that would be a, a pretty big problem because if we have a really huge vector of parameters, then the Hessian is going to be uh, a matrix that is, has the dimensionality of the size of your parameters by the size of your parameters. And the second is that if we take more than one inner gradient step here, do we actually have third or third and fourth order derivatives when you take more inner gradient steps? Um, does anyone have any guesses as to the answer of these questions before I kind of go through some of the math? So there's one guess, which is that maybe we only need the diagonal of the Hessian, which isn't quite correct. Yeah, so she says maybe we only have to compute the Hessian vector products, which, which will turn out to be correct, and we'll go through why that's the case. So, um, so as we talked about before, we can basically view, um, we have this kind of update procedure that takes as input a network, um, a set of parameters and a training data set. And in the MAML case, this update procedure might be something like one gradient descent step on your training loss starting from your meta trained parameters. And uh, it can also be multiple inner gradient steps, but we'll start with the case where it's just one inner gradient step. And then our Meta objective is something like, say, I'm going to write this in my lap. So the, the meta objective is something like min over theta of L of phi i, comma, d trait, or sorry, this is d test i. So this is our kind of the objective with regard to our meta parameters data. Uh, and this is equal to the min over theta of L of F theta D train I comma D test I. Um, and I'm just using F here as shorthand for the, the gradient step. Um, it's going to be helpful to have that shorthand in like for the next step. So in order to optimize this meta objective, um, what does our meta optimization look like? So we, we want to compute the gradient with regard to our parameters data in order to optimize this objective. Um, one side note is that I'm going to use D, um, D, D, X or whatever is to be the total derivative and the gradient uh, with regard to x as the partial derivative, just as kind of to be able to split apart the notation. So in order to do this, this meta optimization, we need to compute the, um, the derivative of our objective, right? And so the first question is, do we have to compute the full Hessian in order to compute this derivative? Do we have to actually like construct that entire Hessian? or do we only need Hessian vector products? So to do that, we'll expand out what this, this derivative looks like. So to do that, we can first take the chain rule and say this derivative is equal to um, the gradient of this loss with respect to phi i times the derivative of um, 
of phi i with respect to theta. So this is equal to first the partial derivative um, of phi bar evaluated at phi bar equals phi i, um, where this kind of equals f of theta comma d train. So this is the derivative of the first term with respect to phi i, and then we also will have a term that looks like d phi i d theta. Um, cool, so this is uh, one, the first kind of expansion of the gradient. Now, if we want to consider what these, what these two terms look like, this first term is going to be a row vector because uh, L is a scalar function. And then the second term is going to be a matrix. Um, and basically the way that you get this row vector is you can get this row vector just by taking a single backward pass through the network. So you just evaluate the loss at phi i and then run a backward pass to get the gradient at phi i. So this is basically just like one backward pass. Now, what is what about the second term? So uh, maybe let's just separately look at this second term. So the second term is, so we know that phi i is equal to one gradient step. And so if we want to compute the derivative of the second term with respect to theta, what we're going to get is d phi i d theta equals the identity. Oh, sorry, I should have, um, this should actually technically be a total derivative. Um, what we'll get is something like the identity minus alpha times d squared d theta squared of L of theta d train. So this term right here, this is the Hessian, right? Um, let's call this H and let's call this row vector R. Then what we get is that this, the gradient with respect to theta is equal to um, R times identity minus alpha R times the Hessian. Uh, and so the way that we got that is we just basically plugged in this term and uh, in for the matrix right here, and we get this. And the result of this is that this means that we only have to do the Hessian vector product between the row vector and the Hessian, and we don't need to worry about actually computing the full Hessian. Okay. Any questions on that? Do you have a question on this? Hi, so um, why is it the case that, I mean, um, why, why do you save anything if you just have to compute the uh, product? Because don't you, yeah, cause like, I, isn't, isn't the way that you get the product by first finding the matrix and then doing the, the, the multiplication? Like, how would you avoid doing work? Yeah, so there are efficient ways to compute um, Hessian vector products without having to construct the full Hessian. Um, I guess I I don't want to get into that too much, uh, but the kind of the, the main takeaway is that to, there are basically ways to compute this Hessian vector product without actually having to construct the full Hessian in memory. Um, yeah, and if you're interested in kind of learning more about some of those techniques, then we could also post some resources on Kretza. And it's also possible that Matt Johnson will go into some of those techniques um, in the lecture on Monday. Okay, and then there's one more thing that we talked about before, which is we are wondering um, if we take more than one inner gradient step, um, do we get third order derivatives and fourth order derivatives. So this is kind of a simple extension on top of what we just showed. So instead of saying that phi i equals one gradient step, 
if we say that phi i equals two gradient steps, then it equals theta minus alpha grad theta L of D train. And then when we take the second gradient step, we're gonna take that second gradient step starting from the result of this first gradient step. So we'll call this the, uh, theta prime. And then the next gradient step will be at theta prime L of theta prime D train. So this is uh, what phi i equals to if we have, um, if you run two gradient steps and what we get um, if we want to compute basically, so the place where the Hessian comes into again here is this matrix right here. And so what we're interested in is if we compute d phi d theta, does this give us the Hessian or does this give us higher order terms? So um, what you get is if you take this phi i on the left and you compute the derivative with respect to theta, then you get something like uh, the identity matrix for theta minus alpha times the uh, Hessian like we had before, L theta d train, and then we for the second term, we get minus alpha, um, and then we actually get, so we're, in this case, we're taking the derivative of this term evaluated at theta, and so we're going to need to, going to, need to apply the chain rule again, uh, and what you get if you do this is you get um, another second derivative, this time actually at theta prime of uh, L of theta prime D train evaluated at theta prime times D theta prime D theta. Uh, so the main takeaway here is that the, basically even if you have two inner gradient steps, the highest order term that you get is still only going to be second derivatives. And the key idea is that the, um, the key idea is, the reason why this is the case is that when you take this second inner gradient step, you take it at theta prime, not at theta. Uh, if you were taking it at theta, um, then you would, well, then basically these terms would combine. Um, but because we're taking it at theta prime, we basically will not get higher order gradients. Yeah, and then I was asking, is it typical to take multiple gradient steps on the same D train? Um, so one thing you could do here is instead of running basically batch gradient descent on your small train set, you could run SGD, where you basically like run one gradient step on the first data point, one gradient step on the second data point, and so forth. When we're in the few shot learning setting, we typically will, um, typically breaking up the, the really small data set that you have into even finer data sets will lead to kind of fairly high variance gradients. And so typically, at least in my experience, I found it most helpful to run multiple gradient steps on the same training data set so that you get um, the least noise in your gradient. Okay. Um, any questions on that? There's actually one more question from about how do we get uh, d theta prime d theta. Um, that's basically the computation that we did up here. Um, it's, yeah, the same as that computation. He's asking, are these higher order differentiations supported by deep learning frameworks? Uh, yes, so both, uh, both TensorFlow and PyTorch and JAX support these second order, taking basically second derivatives with regard to your network. Um, yeah, some especially TensorFlow, especially the more developed ones. Um, in the past, uh, some of them have been a little bit shakier with regard to second derivatives, but I think that both of those, both TensorFlow and PyTorch are developed enough to uh, support these and basically compute all these derivatives for you. Uh, this is mostly just an exercise to understand exactly what's happening under the hood. Uh, when you actually go about implementing these algorithms, you don't actually have to understand um, these calculations for better or for worse. I, th I still think it's helpful to understand them, to know that you don't have to compute this full Hessian, 
and to know that um, you don't get third order derivatives. But uh, in practice, it's actually fairly convenient that we don't have to worry about actually computing these manually when implementing them. Okay, so that's the gist of optimization based meta learning. So now let's talk a bit about how optimization based meta learners and black box meta learners are, how they kind of compare conceptually, what are the benefits of one versus the other. So in black box adaptation, there's this general form of basically having a neural network take as input a training data set and maybe also a test input and produce an output. Uh, and maybe somewhere in the middle here, you may also have um, some, some phi i, uh, or you can abstract that away. Now, um, in model agnostic meta learning, you can actually also view the same kind of general form, uh, but where you have this phi i that is computed with gradient descent, and then you process your test inputs with that network. Um, so in some ways, actually, MAML can be viewed as the same sort of computation graph where you're taking as input a training data set and a test input, but there's this gradient operator that's embedded inside that computation graph. Uh, and I think that this view is, is useful for thinking about how these two methods compare. Uh, in many ways, they're both optimized for doing the same exact thing. It's just that MAML has this structure of an optimization built inside of it so that you can expect it to, um, to essentially still descend on the objective that you care about, at least on the training data set. Now, it's worth noting that you can mix and match components of this computation graph. Uh, and this, this view of things is helpful for understanding how you might do that. Um, so one thing that you could do, for example, is you could learn the initialization and you could also um, instead of using the actual gradient, you could replace the gradient update with a learned network um, that looks something like this, where you learn theta and you also learn this network that takes as input the gradient and modifies it in some way. Uh, this was done in this paper by Sachin Ravi and Hugo Darshel in 2017. It actually precedes the, the MAML algorithm that we've covered. Um, and also this computation group graph view of meta learning will come back again in a couple lectures when we are also comparing and thinking about a third kind of meta learning algorithm. Now, one thing that's maybe worth thinking about in terms of meta learning algorithms is how these methods might do if you're on tasks that are a bit different from what you saw during training. So if you're Given a task that's kind of out of distribution from what you saw during the meta training process, um, MAML will still be running fine tuning or be running gradient descent on that held out task. And so we can still expect it to do something reasonable when provided this out of distribution data. Whereas if you feed that out of distribution data into the black box neural network, you can't really, ex you don't really know exactly what it will do with that data. It might not generalize well. We can actually empirically uh, consider, this, um, consider this exercise of looking at how these methods do on extrapolated tasks. And what we'll do is we'll compare MAML to two forms of black box meta learners. One is called SNAIL and one is called meta networks. Um, that are basically just different kinds of memory-based neural networks that process data with a single network. Um, and we can look at the Omniglot task and we'll construct the, we'll construct different tasks and we'll construct actually out of distribution tasks by skewing the digits and also by scaling the digits. And what we find is um, on each of these cases, we're looking at the performance as you move away from the distribution that things were trained on. Um, of course, as you move from the, like all these algorithms were kind of trained on this distribution and they, they all do pretty well when you are testing on what they're trained on. But when you move away from the manifold of tasks that what they are trained on, we see that all of them degrade. But we see that MAML degrades the least out of the three methods. 
Uh, and this is kind of what we would expect because we're, we're fine tuning on these out of distribution tests. We can still expect them to do something reasonable when you're fine tuning. Um, in contrast to passing this, these out of distribution data points into a uh, black box neural network. Okay. Any questions on this experiment? Here by one shot, do you mean that you're just doing one um, gradient step update to get fly from data? Um, I actually can't remember how many gradient steps were used. Uh, by one shot learning, I mean that there's one example per, uh, per, sorry, yeah, one example per class in the classification process. Oh, got it. Cool, thanks. Of the process, we, we pass in the this sorry. Uh, what part of the process we pass in the data that is skewed or shear? Is it only in the test set, or is it in the meta in the meta test set as well? Right. So the way this experiment was done is that it was meta trained on standard Omniglot, and then at meta test time, we either gave it a training data set that had um, digits that were kind of normal, or we gave it a a task and a meta training data set that had skewed digits or scale digits. So the, the out of distribution tasks are only happening at meta test time, and it's reflected both in the train set and the test set of that meta test task. Yeah, so uh, during this meta test time, so we are again optimizing, right? So how many steps we're doing, like a, just one step of inner and outer region or like a multiple times we do so that error uh, converges. Yeah, that's a good question. So with mammal-based algorithms, um, you want to, the number of gradients, fine-tuning steps that you run at meta test time, you want it to be at least as large as the number of gradients, inner gradient steps that you use during meta training. Although in practice, you can also run more gradient steps if you find that you haven't converged on the, um, if you find that your kind of training accuracy hasn't converged at meta test time. Basically, I mean, a similar, like, let's say, there came like a, a hundred of, uh, Epoch, so we will do a test time like a similar strategy will be applied uh, when we find the thing. Um, so meta test time, I guess typically you don't need to run that much. So you'll kind of typically meta train with one or a few gradient steps, and then at meta test time you might run, um, you might run like up to twenty gradient steps. But typically because these, these in few shot learning because your training data sets are so small, you converge very quickly. Another question, like, is there any insight why, like, for when we, like, there's a skew in the data set, the drop in performance is very low, like, 10%, but, like, for the scaling, the drop is quite high, like, 20% or something. Yeah, right. so I, I wouldn't necessarily think, think that, the, like, I wouldn't necessarily say that, like, this skew is comparable to this scale. Like, you could skew the data even more, and you would probably expect to see a even larger drop in performance. Um, I think that just the scale that's considered here is probably a bit more drastic than the shear that's considered. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, during meta testing, we won't be changing theta, right? The theta is fixed. Yeah, so at meta test time, we uh, start from our, our theta parameters and then we run fine tuning on our training data set from there. And then at the end of fine tuning, we get a set of parameters that we evaluate uh, accuracy on. So this is to get the fire eyes? Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, sounds good. He's asking, in MAML, does the initialization of theta matter a lot? If so, what was the initialization for MAML here? So uh, the, let's go back to the algorithm real quick. So. Um, I guess there's kind of a step zero here, which is to like take an initialization for theta and then uh, at the end of this, you'll get some kind of set of initial parameters theta that are good. Uh, and in general, this initialization here isn't super important. Typically we just use like random initialization. It's about as important as uh, initial parameters are in general with deep learning. Um, and then of course, the final initialization that you get for meta test time is, is very important, uh, and that's exactly what MAML is optimizing for.
is asking how much worse does multitask learning plus fine tuning do on these out of distribution tasks? So we didn't actually evaluate that here, but we would also expect um, multitask learning and fine tuning to be more robust to these out of distribution tasks in comparison to things like snail and uh, meta networks. Yeah, but we don't have, I don't have any results on this specific test, this specific uh, evaluation. Okay, now we get this nice structure of building an optimization into our meta learner, and the structure allows us to potentially generalize better to extrapolated tasks. But one downside is, well, maybe the structure means that we can't express as many learning procedures. So we know that a black box adaptation procedure, if, if this neural network is large enough, then you can represent any learning procedure uh, in the sense that neural networks are universal function approximators. But we don't know if that same statement is true for MAML. We don't know that if our network is big enough, whether it will be able to represent um, any learning procedure when it has this gradient operator inside the computation graph. And so we actually studied this question and it turns out that you can theoretically show that if you have a sufficiently deep network, then this MAML function can approximate any function of the training data set and the test data point um, under a few assumptions. Uh, and the assumptions are fairly, fairly, fairly mild. Uh, the first is that you have to have a non-zero learning rate. Uh, this makes sense. Um, the second assumption is, is pretty important. This is that the loss function gradient cannot lose information about the label. Um, and then the third assumption is that the data points in your training data set have to be unique. Uh, and this is also often true in practice. And the intuition behind this result is that if you view MAML as the computation graph that we talked about before, where there's a gradient operator in the middle, as long as that gradient operator doesn't um, doesn't kind of discard information about your data points in your training data set, then you, um, then you can also still represent, that computation graph can still represent any learning procedure. Uh, and well, why is this important or interesting? Um, this, mean that, this means that MAML has the benefit of inductive bias without losing uh, the expressive power that you get from black box adaptation approach. Um, okay, cool. So now I want to talk a bit about challenges and some of the challenges that come up with this class of approaches and some of the solutions that people have come up with. So one challenge is that the, we have this bi-level optimization in the sense that we're embedding gradient descent inside another gradient descent optimization. And this can exhibit some instabilities. Um, and so there are a few ideas that you could do to try to mitigate this. One is to try to automatically learn your inner learning rate alpha um, or tune your, your outer learning rate in order to uh, not have to worry too much about tuning either of these manually. Uh, in practice, I, do, I have found that like, the inner learning rate is really important for getting things to work well and the outer learning rate, in practice, I found that Adam works well and I can tune the outer learning rate for you but there are also some prior works that have looked at tuning that outer learning rate automatically. Another idea is to only optimize a subset of the parameters in the inner loop. Uh, and this can be a little bit lighter of an optimization in the inner loop and reduce some of the instabilities. Um, the third idea is to decouple the inner learning rate and the batch form statistics for each gradient descent step. So that if you're running one gradient descent step and another gradient descent step um, and a third one, you have different learning rates and different batch form statistics for each step of that inner optimization. Uh, this can also make the optimization a bit more flexible. Um, you can also introduce some context variables to increase the expressive power. Um, I guess the general takeaway that I'd like to get across here is that there's a range of fairly simple tricks that can help the optimization fairly significantly. Um, even the vanilla algorithm works pretty well. Uh, but there are a various number of tricks that can be helpful. Okay, um, it looks like there's a question from. Yeah, I'm pushing the last slide in with the assumptions. Yeah. 
So like, can you explain what do you mean by loss function gazing does not lose information about the label? What does it exactly mean? Yeah, so what this means is that um, basically when you take the gradient of um, a loss function, we, we're passing in the training data set here and um, depending on your choice of loss function, uh, we want to be able to recover the labels of the training data set from the gradient. Um, and there are some, I guess, some examples of this is if you have an L1 loss function, then the gradient is just, uh, it's like one or negative one, essentially. Uh, and this will lose information because depending, like basically how incorrect you are, uh, doesn't really affect, can, if you're incorrect, but you don't know like how incorrect you are, um, that doesn't really affect the gradient of like an L1 loss function. Whereas if you have something more like mean squared error or cross entropy, the gradient is actually much more, um, much more informative about the label. Uh, and you can, if you actually write out the gradient, it's possible to actually to recover the full grade, the full label information from that gradient if you know the model's prediction. Does that answer your question? Well, I guess my loss will also lose information about the label. Sorry, what did you say? So basically, margin loss will also be losing information. Yeah, so the L1 loss and the margin loss will, will also be losing information. Things like L2 and uh, cross entropy loss will not lose information. Um, that isn't to say that you can use all of these loss functions in practice with MAML, and people have been successful using these loss functions. Um, it's just a, a kind of a criterion for pr proving this result. Um, and you don't really need this result to hold true for, um, for most learning procedures that you care about in practice. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about two more challenges. So one challenge, one more challenge, and this is actually perhaps one of the most important challenges, is that if you have a lot of inner gradient steps, then backpropagating through those inner gradient set steps can actually be pretty compute intensive and pretty memory intensive because you typically have to store all the iterates of that inner optimization and then backpropagate all the way through it. There have been a few approaches for trying to tackle this challenge and I'll highlight three of them. So the first is that instead of trying to backpropagate through that optimization path from theta to phi i, you could crudely approximate this Jacobian as the identity function and basically assume that, um, that things at phi i look like things at theta. Um, this is a very crude approximation. Uh, in practice, this Jacobian is actually nowhere near identity from what I found. Uh, although somewhat surprisingly, this actually does work for simple few shot learning problems. Um, anecdotally, I found that this doesn't work well for more complex meta-learning problems. Um, so your mileage may vary. Um, this is kind of known as first order mammal. Uh, and then there's also the reptile algorithm that does something fairly similar to this approximation as well. Um, it's called first order mammal in the sense that you don't actually need second order gradients if you make this approximation. Uh, and this kind of relates to the calculations that we were doing earlier as well. Okay, um, another idea is to only optimize the last layer of the weights in your inner optimization. So before we were saying that we were gonna fine tune all of the weights in the network, but one thing you could do is just fine tune the last layer. Uh, and there are a number of approaches that have done this where they basically optimize both for, for a set of features such that when you optimize um, on top of that with logistic regression, ridge regression, or support vector machine, you generalize well with a small amount of data. Uh, and one of the things that's pretty cool about these kinds of approaches is that it can actually, um, the, uh, when you do this kind of ridge regression and, and logistic regression as well as a, a support vector machine, this leads to either a closed form optimization or a convex optimization in the inner loop. And there are kind of various other techniques for actually differentiating through these closed form or convex optimizations that make it, uh, a lot more efficient in practice. Um, so if you're in a setting where kind of optimizing just the last layer will kind of be expected to work well, 
then um, this is a very reasonable approach. If you think that you may need to fine tune much deeper than that, then of course this won't be uh, quite as helpful. Um, now the last idea is there's also a way to derive the metagradient using what's called the implicit function theorem. Um, and it basically allows you to compute d phi i uh, d theta without actually having to backpropagate through the optimization path, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, for time, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but if you want to see a derivation of how this works, you can check out the lecture from last year. Okay, um, and this kind of leads to some nice memory and computation trade-offs, where basically as you increase the number of inner gradients, descent steps, the uh, basically the memory cost is completely constant as you increase the number of gradient descent steps, and the computation cost uh, is increases more slowly if you do this in comparison to backpropagating through the optimization path. Cool. So I was asking in the chat, what's the difference between phi and theta? So um, basically in the context of optimization-based meta-learning, we're saying that phi i um, is basically the result of running fine tuning starting initialized at theta. So if the theta is the initialization of fine tuning and phi i is the result of fine tuning. I'm using a subscript i to denote that this fine tuning process uh, takes as input a data set uh, d train that's specific to task i. Um, so in some ways theta is the meta parameters and phi i is the task specific parameters that have been fine tuned for that task. Okay, um, yeah, and then one other cool thing about this is this also allows for second order optimizers in the inner loop because you don't have to back propagate through those second order optimizers, which would lead to third order optimization. Um, and this has led to some good performance. Okay, cool. Um, and then the last challenge that I'd like to mention is that uh, some of the, the architecture that works well for optimization based meta learner, meta learning isn't always the same as architectures that work for deep learning. Uh, and one uh, work has actually combined neural architecture search with MAML to try to find an architecture that works well with MAML. Uh, and they found that fairly non-standard architectures that are very deep and narrow uh, actually led to pretty large gains in performance on something like mini image net um, in comparison to using a more standard architecture. Okay, cool. So to summarize optimization-based adaptation and meta-learning, uh, the kind of the key idea is to acquire phi i through an optimization rather than through a neural network directly. And this involves constructing a bi-level optimization problem. There are a number of benefits to this approach. So you get kind of this positive inductive bias at the start of meta-learning because you're already going to be fine-tuning, which is already a reasonable way to transfer to a new task. Uh, and then from there, you're just going to be improving upon the initialization or the learning rate or other aspects of the optimization. Uh, as we saw, it tends to extrapolate better than black box meta learners. Um, it's also maximally expressive if you have a sufficiently large network. And it's model agnostic in the sense that it should be fairly straightforward to combine with different architectures. Uh, the downside is that it typically requires a second order optimization uh, and it's usually more compute and memory intensive than black box meta learning approaches. Questions? Uh, yeah. uh, can you illustrate again what does this positive inductive bias mean? Yeah, so what I mean by positive inductive bias is just the sense that you're building an optimization into the meta learner. So you already have um, you're already kind of starting from this optimization that you know will do somewhat reasonably um, in the sense that fine tuning does somewhat reasonably when you have data from a new task. Whereas if you just have a black box neural network that doesn't know anything about optimization, then it doesn't have that, it, what I'm calling inductive bias. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was somewhat curious about the second order. So, in conventional um, SGD, you have an update, 
and then you have a separate neuron filter to put the gradient of your most recent updated parameter with respect to the parameter itself. Um, so that parameter itself contains its history and so it contains previous updates. Um, how is how is optimization technique that you've described different from a conventional SGD where you just update a cafe gradient of a, para, a parameter that's continuously updated? Yeah, so the I guess in some ways this is similar to what I was mentioning with regard to transfer learning, where whoops, um, where transfer learning is doing something like basically min over theta of L of theta D train, whereas something like this meta learning approach is doing min of L of theta minus alpha grad theta D train. Um, in some ways you can, like this optimization, you're still gonna be doing this optimization with an SGD approach. So that kind of outer optimization is just the same as vanilla SGD. Um, what's just a little bit different is that you have this, you have this gradient operator inside of your objective. And so you need to be thinking about actually this second order optimization because you need to back propagate um, through a gradient step itself. Uh, but if you take kind of the computation graph view of things and just view this gradient operator as being part of your computation graph, then there are a lot of similarities. Okay, that's what I want to clarify because in reality, in your process learning, theta is nothing but, you know, theta free minus alpha um, del theta, right? Uh, can you repeat that? Yeah, so in the transfer learning approach, in the equation on top, uh, the equation is actually uh, min theta L theta, but theta is nothing but just the previous equation of theta, so theta previous minus alpha times. Yeah, so okay, one thing that's different is that, so I see what your point, so basically, this is like theta at iteration i, and theta at iteration i is yeah. equal to basically theta at iteration i minus one minus a gradient step, basically. Exactly, yeah. um, one thing that's different here is that it's, so in, in SGD, you don't really keep track. You're taking kind of the, the partial derivative at theta i. You're not kind of really keeping track of how that is a function of theta i minus one. Um, whereas here, you when you do this, you need to actually um, back propagate through this gradient step right here. Um, into your previous value of theta and optimize kind of your previous value of theta, um, the initialization such that a gradient step gives you good performance. Um, and so this affects the way that you implement these algorithms um, because you can't just say we're gonna take a gradient step and then optimize, like, and then actually kind of do like, assign your parameters to have that value and then take a gradient step again. Um, in many ways, it's kind of the difference between a total derivative and a partial derivative. Um, I have a second question. You call it an inner and outer step, but these, these, out, these outer steps are nothing but training on different tasks, and the inner step is training updating parameters theta for each task of the. Uh, so, why the inner and outer? Because this could actually be done in parallel. Um, so, this, so there's a sum over i here, and this is what I call the inner step, and then the kind of things that are used to optimize this is called the outer step. Uh, you need to compute the inner step for multiple different tasks. And then once you do that, you'll need to compute the outer step on each of those tasks as well, and then average. Um, the outer step is computed, um, like when you, when you compute the gradient here, that gradient will kind of, can go inside the sum here, and you will be computing the kind of the meta gradient for each of your tasks, and then averaging. Water, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, could you explain like why uh, the memo is easy to like uh, combine with like different models of architecture? Because like the uh, the theta, we still need an architecture to like to know it from. Right? Yeah, I guess when I say that, I just mean that basically all of these equations are only having to do with the parameters of your model and don't really prescribe anything about the architecture of that model. Um, whereas with a black box approach, you need to figure out how to uh, combine whatever architecture you like to process data with an architecture that can process like multiple data points. Uh, that said, this optimization will become more difficult if computing gradients for that architecture are more difficult. Like if you have a, a recurrent neural network, then MAML can be a bit more tricky to combine with a recurrent neural network because 
you have to kind of backpropagate gradients through time through that recurrent network. Okay, thank you. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm gonna go through this case study and then I'll try to answer additional questions at the end at 2.20. So uh, this case study was looking at how we could use meta-learning for a few shot land cover classification, uh, which is a pretty cool application. And this was actually a, a pretty recent paper that was at the Earth Vision Workshop at CVPR this year. Uh, and if you're interested, the link to the paper is also right here, which you can find in the slides. So the problem that they're looking at is trying to map land covering from satellite images. And uh, they looked at a few different data sets. Uh, and this is basically what the problem looks like. You have some sa satellite imagery that looks like these images here. And your goal is to output something like uh, these segmentation images. Uh, the first data set is a lower resolution data set where you basically say like, within a certain region, what is kind of the predominant uh, use of that land, whereas this, uh, this data set is much more fine-grained. And different ca categories of land covering include urban, agricultural, rangeland, forest, water, barren, uh, and unknown. And if we can successfully kind of classify land covering, then this may have applications in global ur urban planning when you're figuring out actually how to use land in different ways, uh, climate change research, and potentially other uh, earth science applications. Now, what are some of the challenges that come up here? So first, labeling data is really expensive. Uh, you have to label kind of individual pixels, or in this case, uh, label something that's a little bit lower resolution, but you still have to go through maps and hand label these things. And also different regions look very different and have different land use proportions. So we have kind of a lot of distribution shift, both in like P of X, both in the image distribution, as well as in P of Y, which is the kind of use of those different pieces of land. So for example, if you look at kind of croplands from four different countries, from Mali, Brazil, Poland, and Angola, we see pretty substantial differences between the images from these countries. So the way that they framed this as a meta-learning problem was different tasks corresponded to different regions of the world, such as these four regions, for example. And their goal was to be able to segment or classify images from a new region with a small amount of data from that region by leveraging the data from the other regions. So essentially, they took kind of the, the mammal algorithm and were trying to learn an initialization such that you could quickly fine tune that model to accurately classify these satellite images in different regions of the world. Okay, and then kind of more specifically, how did they frame this as a meta learning problem? So they did this a little bit differently for the two data sets because the data sets had different characteristics. For the first data set, they, um, there was geographic metadata that was provided as part of the data set. And so they split it into meta training, meta val, and meta test sets shown in these different colors. And so they're holding out different geographic regions in the MetaVal set and the meta test set. And then they constructed a meta-learning problem by trying to be able to classify between different kinds of uh, lands, such as forest or croplands, um, given a small number of patches from that, um, from that region of the, the world. So this is an example of a two-way, two-shot classification task. Uh, and then for the second data set, um, they didn't actually have any geographic metadata in the data set, unfortunately. So they used clustering to try to guess different regions. And then they held out different clusters for the meta validation set and the meta test set. Um, and then they framed a one-shot learning problem for the segmentation task as the following, where they took a very small patch of a much larger region. They labeled this as the support set. And then they evaluated the model on the query set on other patches of the data. And like as an example, this kind of large region is a, an image that's like 2,400 pixels by 2,400 pixels. Uh, and the label would look something like this. Uh, and what they found in their evaluation is they compared basically um, training on your new data at meta test time just from scratch 
They compared to pre-training on all of your metadata combined and then fine-tuning on this. And they also compared to running MAML on the meta-training data set and adapting to the test data. Uh, and what they found is on the first data set, they were able to first do kind of significantly better with MAML than with a pre-trained model and a random model. Um, in the case where you have between one and 10 shots, 10 data points. And when you had zero data points, the pre-trained model did the best. Uh, and this is also what we'd expect because MAML needs data to fine tune. And of course the randomly initialized network also needs data to fine tune. Um, also on the deep globe data set, uh, they saw similar results on the clustered split where they were kind of adapting to a new region that was held out. Um, whereas when they did a more random split, they found that uh, the pre-trained network and MAML perform somewhat similarly when you have a few shots. Okay, so this is pretty cool. It's kind of a more real world application of where meta-learning might be useful when you want to adapt to different regions of the world. Um, and then if you're interested, there's kind of more visualizations and more analysis in the paper. And also both of these data sets are publicly available if you're interested in studying them yourself, for example, for your final project. Okay, um, so that's it for today. We talked about optimization-based meta-learning and uh, the basics of the techniques and how to trade off, kind of some of the trade-offs between black box and optimization-based techniques. Um, kind of the roadmap for the upcoming lectures is that next week on Monday, we'll have a guest lecture from Matt Johnson where he'll talk about automatic differentiation and how our deep learning softwares actually compute the derivatives for things that we talked about today and for just neural networks in general. And on Wednesday, we'll start talking about the last class of meta learners, which is uh, non-parametric learners. And we'll also cover kind of a general comparison of all of the three approaches that we've discussed. And then the following week, we'll talk about more advanced meta learning topics, uh, topics that are also still quite important though, especially if you wanna use meta learning in your final project. And in week five, we'll start reinforcement learning.